Nathan Charlton here, and uh, Dr. Chris Holsteg, director of the Blue Ridge Poison Center, faculty member um, in toxicology and emergency medicine at the University of Virginia. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about bath salts today. We've heard a lot about bath salts in the news, um, seen them a lot in the emergency department, a lot of sort of myths out there, a lot of speculation, um, just a lot of ideas. Hopefully we can clarify some of that today. Um, maybe set the record straight and uh, answer some questions you all may have about bath salts. Uh, so first of all, you know, Dr. Holstead, we hear about all these bath salts out there. What, what are bath salts? You know, when you hear bath salts, you think that these are substances you can buy in the grocery store and put into your bath. That's not at all what they are. These are actually synthetic compounds that are derived from chemicals that are used for abuse, and so these are being abused. And when they're sold, people aren't buying them for bath salts to put in their bath. They know through the Internet and through chat rooms that these are indeed illicit substances. So how do they get the name bath salt? Well, they initially sold them as actually bath salts. The packages look like bath salts. Uh, they even infringed on other companies such as Ivory Wave, uh, but in fact, again, they're not bath salts. And they're pretty expensive, you know, $40 a packet for uh, just a little bit of powder to put in your bath. Um, I don't think anybody would really buy it for uh, their baths. So are people making these or buying them at the store? Where, where do people seem to get these things? So many of them, before they were made illegal in the United States and various states initially and then uh, the entire United States, you could buy these at you know, convenience stores, you could buy them at head shops. There's a number of different places you could get them. But most people were buying them on the Internet. And these appear to be produced by people who are very bright in chemistry, uh, who are making compounds that can be used for abuse, and then selling them online. Well, you mentioned sort of legal, illegal. You know, I it, you know I can buy. It sounds like I can buy them on the internet, um, or used to be able to buy them on the internet. I mean, what you know, where did this term bath salt come about, and 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 how are you know how are people getting them? Are they illegal? I mean, how does that work? Well, it was brilliant, wasn't it? If you want to be a producer of illicit substances, or substances that may not even be illegal yet, but that are abused, uh, you advertise it on chat rooms that are associated with people who abuse drugs, and then you market it as something completely different so that the governments can't figure out what it is that's coming in. And so it looks fairly innocent coming over as bath salts. And realize that it hasn't been advertised only as bath salts, but also as fertilizer, plant food, um, scratch remover, a number of different things, which in fact, again, they were never intended to be a fertilizer, never intended to be a bath salt, but instead had a substances that were going to be used to be get high. Now, the question in regards to legality, some of these substances are so new that governments have never seen these. And so it wasn't until poison centers started to pick up in emergency departments that these were showing up and people were sick that uh, these were a problem. So, you know, they've got all these fancy names and, and you know, methadrone and MDPV and, you know, it's hard to keep all of these straight. Um, are they things I should be scared of? I mean, you know, the, these words sort of you know, make people scared about these things and, and you know, big words, big terms, but um, are there other compounds out there like them? Yeah, there are, and they're rapidly emerging. Um, we saw in Richmond, Virginia, for example, a compound called 25i, which had not been seen previously. We've seen uh, uh, compounds, if you remember, the synthetic cannabinoids that came out. So there's a whole host of compounds that are rapidly emerging from labs, most likely overseas, uh, marketing it as other substances that are not intended for human consumption, and also realize that none of these substances have been uh, tried in humans. So now people are abusing substances that are meant as stimulants, or to get high, hallucinogens, and in fact might cause other medical problems, and we are in fact seeing that. Uh, so what are you seeing when they come into the emergency department? So probably one of the most common things that has been reported is just the agitation. People are, are what appear to be acutely psychotic. Uh, they've lost their grip on reality, they're agitated, they need to be sedated, but all organ systems have been affected. In fact, we published in Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2012, a case that we had at the University of Virginia, uh, where a patient came in markedly agitated uh, and had basically every organ system affected from the kidneys to the liver to the heart, fully recovered after a long time period in the hospital, 
But that we found the only thing in the system was this what they call MDPV, which is what is found in bath salts. So how many people are using these? How often do you see this? We don't know exactly. The prevalence uh, is going to be very difficult to determine. Um, routine drug screens don't pick these up. People now, especially with it illegal, are not going to be quick to say that they're using bath salts. And so I think the exact prevalence is going to be difficult. However, we do know from the Poison Center data that there is a tremendous spike in bath salts that began to occur um, really at the end of 2010 and going into 2011. Now, there's been some leveling off of that, but that may be a reporting bias at this time because, again, the users know it's illegal and the emergency physicians who tend to call in know what bath salts are, so they're not calling in as much. And so it sounds like many people are getting these off the Internet. Um, you know, are there chat rooms out there? How is the word spread? There are chat rooms out there, and they do appear to spread that way. So it's the use of new media. In the past, if you think about the 1980s, where would you go to get your drugs of abuse? Well, you had a buddy who knew a buddy who got it from somebody who was on a street corner. Um, now, you don't need a buddy who knows a buddy. You need just to know what websites to go on. And if you go to some of these drug abuse websites, these chat rooms, you can find out what products are out there that they should use. You sort of mentioned the agitation and psychosis. Um, are there specific physical exam findings I'm going to look for in a patient or specific labs? How do I evaluate these patients? It's a challenge because we don't completely know. We know these are sympathomimetic. They rev up the system. They tend to make big pupils, your heart fast, blood pressure high, uh, agitation, confusion. Um, but again, it's hard to know. There's probably a dose response as with any substance. And the other problem we run into is, again, you can't pick these up on drug screen. So even if someone says they're doing a bath salt, they may have been doing something else, like cocaine. And so some of the reports in the literature that you read now talk about bath salts and the clinical effects, yet there's no diagnostics to know, was it truly MDPV or mephedrone that was there? So a lot of confusion right now. Uh, it's not clear. I think as time goes on, there'll be more clarity um, as to exactly what do these do. But there's a lot of factors that come into play. Well, so again, you mentioned all these sort of chemical terms and, you know, emergency physician, you know, I, I don't know all these chemical terms it could make me a little bit nervous here. And um, I have a patient that comes in and maybe got into bath salts and you know, maybe it's this one term versus another term. And, and is there something I could, you know, is there a way I can treat all these patients? Is there something that I could potentially mess up by not treating one versus the other? Or do I need to memorize all these different chemical compounds? No, you don't. And I think that's the one thing, uh, the beauty of emergency medicine is that you're going to be looking at the what they're coming with signs and symptoms. If I have a markedly agitated patient, the first thing I'm going to do is get that patient to calm down before they do harm to themselves or do harm to another person. And that is what is being used primarily as benzodiazepines. Now, certainly, if they're markedly agitated, you can't get control uh, with benzodiazepines. Uh, there's... Uh, some of these cases are being uh, rapid sequence intubated and put on a vent until the system works it out. But the first and foremost is to calm these patients down, get control, and then uh, look for other end organ toxicity that may be there. You know, other than benzos, are there any specific antidotes you would use? No. So uh, benzos are going to be the primary treatment. You know, there's going to be debate amongst uh, groups, should we use something like Haldol? Um, and I don't think we 